97 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. A tenuous cessation of hostilities appears to have taken hold between Israel and the Iranian proxy Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza after two days in which approximately 100 rockets and mortar shells were fired indiscriminately toward Israel. South Korean tourists are forced to return home after being stranded in Israel when flights between the countries were halted in light of concerns over the coronavirus outbreak. Syrian government forces continue to push northward, backed by Iranian proxies and Russian air support, as part of a wide-scale offensive that aims to recapture the last jihadist-controlled Idlib northwestern region in the war-torn country. A tenuous cessation of hostilities appears to have taken hold between Israel and the Iranian proxy Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza after two days in which approximately 100 rockets and mortar shells were fired indiscriminately toward Israel's southern communities while the Israeli military conducted wide-scale bombardments of militant installations in both the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip and in Syria. At the height of hostilities yesterday evening, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a security assessment with Israel's top defense officials, after which he leveled a threat to the jihadist groups in the coastal Palestinian enclave. If calm is not restored, Israel will resort once again to targeted assassinations of the leaders of the terrorist organizations. <laughs> ואנחנו מוסיפים להכות עכשיו עם מטוסים, עם טנקים, עם מסוקים, ואנחנו נמשיך להכות עד שיושב השקט. אבל יש לי גם מסר לראשי ארגוני הטרור. אם לא יושב השקט, אתם הבאים בתור. Shortly thereafter, at around 11 p.m., following extensive negotiations behind the scenes by means of Egyptian and UN mediation, an Islamic Jihad spokesperson announced that a ceasefire had taken effect. While Israeli officials did not immediately confirm the matter, the IDF spokesperson's unit announced a gradual return to routine for Israel's southern communities. Nevertheless, despite the tense quiet, the IDF Home Front Command instructed schools to remain closed throughout the day, forcing some 65,000 students to remain at home. During the course of this last round of hostilities, the Israeli military's Iron Dome anti-rocket batteries managed to intercept some 90% of the incoming projectiles. Sadly, several rockets managed to penetrate the Israeli aerial defense system, consequently striking populated areas. As a result, one man was moderately injured and another 15 people sustained light injuries. Speaking from a children's playground where a rocket struck yesterday, a local resident asserted that the efforts by the jihadists to destroy the Jewish state will not break Israel's spirit of fortitude. In spite of the 10 year ceasefire, which seemingly holds, IDF spokesperson Jonathan Konlikus reiterated the military's preparedness and commitment to defend the state of Israel and its citizens. And I can say that the IDF is ready, prepared, and committed to continue to defend Israel and Israeli sovereignty if the Islamic Jihad or any other terrorist organization doesn't stop attacking Israel. Turning now to the United Nations headquarters in New York, where the UN Security Council unanimously passed a resolution endorsing a two-state solution for the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The resolution, which was also supported by the United States, does not mention President Donald Trump's peace initiative, commonly known as the so-called deal of the century. Nevertheless, the resolution does not relate to the Palestinian demand for an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, nor does it grant the Palestinians their demand for all of the West Bank, which includes the Jordan Valley and the biblical districts of Judea and Samaria. Council members reiterated their support for a negotiated two-state solution, recalling previous relevant UN resolutions and in accordance with international law, where two democratic states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side in peace within secure and recognized borders. 
During the Security Council session, UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Nikolai Mladenov, reported on the situation in the region and called for an immediate end to the rocket fire and mortar shells at Israel. Mr. President, I take this opportunity to call for an immediate stop to the firing of rockets and mortars that only risk dragging Gaza into another round of hostilities with no end in sight. The indiscriminate launching of rockets against civilian population centers violates international law and must end. Mladeno further provided the Security Council with a clear overview of the latest hostilities. Overall, during the reporting period, over 110 projectiles have been fired from Gaza towards Israeli communities, injuring four people, including a woman and a child. More than 100 incendiary balloons were released towards Israel many carrying explosive devices. In response, the IDF has fired 102 missiles against Hamas and PIJ targets in Gaza, injuring seven Palestinians, including two children. In light of the report, member states expressed their concern over the latest escalation between Israel and the jihadist organizations in the Gaza Strip and urged both Israel and the Palestinians to finally return to the negotiating table for the purpose of finding a viable solution to their conflict. Turning now to Israel's Ben Gurion International Airport, where South Korean tourists are forced to return home after being stranded in Israel when flights between the countries were halted in light of concerns over the coronavirus outbreak. Also, 180 South Koreans returned earlier this week. Another several hundred remain isolated at the Tel Aviv airport. Nevertheless, one of the Korean tourists insisted that the Israeli government and South Korean embassy were working to resolve the issue. We have uh, nothing problem, everything fixed. And we are really praying now that everybody will be go to Korea be safe. I know the government of Israel, they carrying these people and the embassy of Korea, they uh, uh, helping these people. And I think so, everything will be okay. John Young also mentioned his concern over perceived anger by the Israeli public toward the South Korean visitors because of an incident in which Korean pilgrims that were infected by the coronavirus unknowingly traveled across the Jewish state. Well, I'm a little bit uh, worrying that Israel people, they will not really scare a lot to Korean people because it's like, you know, everything is to be, we are good friends and we, we need a great, good friendship. And, I don't want to broke, uh, break everything like this. Okay? According to domestic reports, Israeli authorities were initially looking at the possibility of moving some 200 South Korean tourists into quarantine at a military base next to Jerusalem. Nevertheless, after local residents protested the measure, authorities decided to transport the group to an isolated section of Ben Gurion Airport, where they will remain until their departure. It is important to highlight that during the demonstration, Israelis emphasized that their anger was not with the South Korean people, but rather with authorities that wanted to put the tour group in a military base that is situated in the heart of their community. We're doing here, we're demonstrating against this very crazy idea of bringing um, the 200 Koreans who, we know Koreans are lovely people and this is none of their fault, but uh, they're bringing them into a community, into the heart of the community. Turning now to Israel's northern neighbor Syria, where the Syrian government forces continue to push northward, backed by Iranian proxies and Russian air support, as part of a wide-scale offensive that aims to recapture the last jihadist-controlled region in the war-torn country after nine years of devastating conflict. In the past two days, Turkish-backed Islamist rebels managed to seize the town of Nairab less than two days after the Syrian army captured the territory. A Turkish security official confirmed that the Turkish military had supported the rebel offensive with shelling and that the Islamist militants were now clearing the town. It is further important to know that Ankara's involvement has come at a heavy cost, as 17 members of the Turkish military have been killed. Nevertheless, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan keeps promoting Ankara's determination to repel the Assad regime from capturing the border territory. Speaking at a press conference this morning in Ankara before his scheduled departure to Azerbaijan, Erdogan noted that while Turkish-Russian talks are ongoing, a planned summit that Ankara hopes would include the leaders of Russia, Turkey, France and Germany was not yet fully agreed upon. <laughs> Fakat 
bu hafta sonu yapılan görüşmelerle ilgili ise Sayın Macron'la aynı şekilde Merkel ve Sayın Putin arasında tam bir ittifak söz konusu değil. Well, Turkey is dealing with challenges on its southern border with Syria. A 5.7 magnitude earthquake struck near its eastern border with Iran, devastating dozens of villages and towns in both countries. According to the Turkish Health Ministry, nine people lost their lives while 37 others were injured, including nine in critical condition. According to reports, more than 1,000 buildings collapsed in Turkey alone, prompting wide-scale rescue efforts to find those trapped under rubble. In contrast to Turkey, which received international aid to deal with this natural disaster, Iran did not immediately respond to TV7's request for comment. Thank you for watching us. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem as well as the peace and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan. Have a Erev Tov, and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.